Yes. So Quill, welcome. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, the Civ Mill divide, the civilian military divide, is something that if you're on one side of it, you know it, you experience it every day. And if you're on the other side of it, you might not even know it exists. You probably don't. Uh, just because uh, such a small fraction of our country experienced the wars in the last uh, 20 years in a direct way, it's not your grandfather's uh, military, your grandparents' military, where uh, sort of, uh, you know, everyone would have served. I, I'm starting out the, when I started covering veterans in 2012, um, I would get that a lot. I'd ask people, well, you know, anyone in your family a veteran? They'd say, no. Oh, yeah, you know, my grandfather served in Korea for World War II. And that's because everybody's grandfather served. Uh, what we had with the all-volunteer military, we started at the end of Vietnam uh, as an idea to, uh, it was much better for the military, but for society, it, it seems to have been more problematic. I mean, even the designers of the, Civ, of the all volunteer force knew that, tried to make it so that people would have to uh, mobilize huge numbers of reserves in order to have this be a shared experience. And I, I know, you know people who've tuned into this can probably think of reasons why you would want it to be a shared experience, namely that you can't have a war for 20 years, go on for 20 years without you know, involving much of the population and having more people with skin in the game. You, th you think it'd be part of the reason why Afghanistan went on for as long as it did and seemingly under the radar for so long is just because it was very few who were sacrificing over and over again. And most of us could kind of go around about our daily basis but without ever thinking about what's going on in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, I mean, that's it. So first of all, there's the cost. It was, you know, the, the human cost that was borne by so few people in Iraq and Afghanistan over 20 years um, you know, less than 7,000 military casualties. But it's also about the mission. And there was this, uh, this mission creep that was happening the whole time. I mean, those of us who covered those wars watched it. Um, but, or rather just a, you know, a, a constant shifting of the goalposts and inability to de define the mission in both of those wars. And, and that could only happen when there isn't really enough political capital on the line. Um, and, and yeah, that was definitely part of the Civ Mill divide. You did three separate stories for Rough Translation. Uh, the one that really stuck out to me the most was Alicia and Matt Lammers. Uh, Matt was a triple amputee, PTSD, probably a, a traumatic brain injury as well. Um, and you talk about that, that uneven sacrifice of so few people, but it's, it's not just the vets, it's, it's the caregivers as well. And this can be incredibly isolating, can it? Yeah, I mean, we, um, when I first uh, set out to uh, tell Matt Lammer's story, I, I went to visit him over five years ago uh, because I had heard uh, he was having trouble. Uh, he was sev uh, severely wounded. One of only scores of people who survived three or more uh, limbs being amputated. Uh, and he was not the story that I had told many times that the VA uh, was happy to have me uh, tell that the, you know, Walter Reed was happy to have me visit with someone who was uh, cheerfully moving on with their life, uh, smiling after having served their country. He was struggling. It was very dark. And uh, his wife and caregiver, Alicia, really bore the brunt of that. And I didn't find that out until later. Um, but, you know, following him over those, over those years, I did. And honestly, she was in a situation that any sane person would have walked away from, would have left with a clean conscience. And I, I think that was sort of the first instinct most of our listeners had would be, you know, what are you doing in that relationship? PTSD or not, he's abusing you, get out. And that's a situation for many, many caregivers. But the issue is they weren't saying, Alicia, get out of there, we got this. They were saying, get out of there and, you know, who cares what happens to this triple amputee? I mean, they weren't saying that, but that was the point. There wasn't, uh, you know, he had managed to push away many kinds of help. Um, and, uh, you know, he was making it very difficult to be helped, but this was all directly related to his trauma at, at war. So um, we looked deeply into that. And one of the things about that story is that Alicia uh, was sort of a, I, I'd say, you know, Medal of Honor level civilian service crossing the Civ Mill divide to help and really save a veteran who was struggling that the rest of society clearly wasn't going to help. And uh, as 
as isolating it can be to be a triple amputee, um, to be a caregiver of a triple amputee that has had has has so many other issues going on. Um, I mean, at least if you're a vet, people can thank you for your service and understand at least, you know, in theory, what you've gone through. But a caregiver, they're just, they're there. They're kind of stuck. And who's there to help them, honestly? Yeah, I mean, the VA has a program uh, for caregivers that's uh, been around for over a decade now, and it's been reformed significantly in recent years. Um, And I would want to say that, you know, the, the physical wounds, I think, were not isolating him. They were, you know, he had some issues with mobility, but he was, uh, when things were going well for him, he was able to swim in the warrior games, be able to do just about anything uh, with adaptive equipment. Um, so it wasn't inherent, inherently isolating, but I think all the trauma he was carrying and what they were dealing with together was, was definitely isolating for them. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's that idea that you can't possibly imagine what someone has gone through uh, that, I mean, we're here to try and dispel tonight. But it is important to say that uh, both the military side and the civilian side, uh, you know, have to have the courage and the imagination to say, I can understand across this divide. I can be understood across this divide. It's not always going to be easy, but it's, it's really important for our, you know, our friends and neighbors, ourselves, and for our democracy. So I, I was going through a series of stories you did way back in 2010 when you were still um, covering Afghanistan. And it feels like you could have written those stories last week and it would have been just just as accurate. You did a story going to the history of the graveyard of empires and talked to people on the ground who were starting to see NATO troops as the next invaders instead of liberators. Do you feel like anybody was listening back then? Yeah, you know, it, it's a... It's a really uh, funny. I, I don't know when we scheduled this uh, webinar, Steve. You asked me months ago, I think, and you know it was a, a very different conversation. I thought we were going to be having in a much calmer moment. But I, I think what's really been crushing about this is that I mean, so many veterans, as as these wars sort of morphed, and the mission was this, or the mission was to build a nation, or the mission mission was counterterrorism or counterinsurgency. And all of that, I, I've talked to so many veterans over the years who said, listen, for me, the mission was protecting my buddies and the, the men and women to my left and right. And to be able to cling to that and say, you know, I don't know what that war was about. Nobody can really explain it anymore. But uh, I'll tell you, for me, it was about what I did that day and I served honorably. Um, what The terrible thing that's happened all of a sudden, and you know, a lot of us saw it coming, a lot of Afghans saw it coming, but I think no one, I've spoken to no one who can honestly say they, that it would happen this fast, um, is you know, this abandonment of the country, uh, right or wrong as a decision, there was a sudden realization about all the people being left behind, and particularly the special immigrant visa, the, pe- the holders, the, the Afghans who were promised that if they served alongside American troops in Afghanistan, they would be given a visa to the United States. That program has been problematic for a decade, but very suddenly all of these people who could say, I served honorably, my honor is clean, I kept my promises, all their promises were broken on them. And the moral injury to that is just incalculable. Um, I mean, I know among many other people probably on this call, I was working really around the clock to get my closest, the people who I owe my tail to out of Afghanistan by any means I could. And it was complete, it was completely arbitrary, I think, whose efforts succeeded and whose didn't. And the, the guilt of leaving someone behind when you made that promise and that promise has now been broken on you. Um, it's something we're going to be dealing with for a long time. Yeah, I, and I think we're going to get into that as, as the hour goes along. Um, I, is, if this is too personal, then then you know feel free to wave me off. But you stopped covering, you stopped being a foreign correspondent in 2012. We still had you know both wars going on at that point. What made you decide that it was time to come home? Yeah, well, you know, my wife actually lived with me in Kabul for the last two years that I was covering the wars. Before that, I'd covered, I covered Iraq for a decade and Afghanistan for almost 12 years, you know, in and out. And um, honestly, I decided that it was, I'd done my part. 
and I wanted to come home. Um, I mean, I feel lucky that I found the uh, NPR created this beat covering the VA and veterans because it allowed me to move on without drawing, you know, just throwing away the past. I have other colleagues who covered war and they ended up covering, say, education, or the environment, which are two topics that are as important, more mm -hmm. important than VA and veterans. But uh, they had to kind of uh, just forget that they'd been at war for the last dozen years. And for me, I was able to, you know, start each conversation with where'd you serve? Oh yeah, you know, with the DFAC up by the mountainside, whatever. I knew the places and names. And then I could just wade into knowing absolutely nothing about the Byzantine methods of the VA. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, that's been a learning curve and it's, uh, it's still going. Yeah, there's a real hunger for that connection. And it's also a reason um, why it's important to encourage veterans to, to, to get into journalism and, and try to help people establish a career here. Just another way to get over that civilian military divide. All right, I was kind of hoping that maybe Marcus would be able to chime in here. Um, but we, if we can get to him, we'll get to him at the end if he, if he comes in a little later. But uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Gretchen Catherwood. Um, her son, Alec, was... Uh, was part of the 3-5 the or the Dark Horse Battalion, um, which is based at Camp Pendleton. This is the unit that had uh, more Marines killed, 25, than any other. Um, he was killed in, in Sangin in Helmand Province in, in October 2010. You know, I was, I was thinking about Gretchen, though, um, after the 13 U.S. service members were, were killed in Kabul at the airport. You know, the Pentagon waits 24 hours after they notify all the families before releasing the names of those killed. It gives everyone a time to tell their, their friends and relatives before this hits the media. It, in, in this case, with so many families, it actually took a, a few days. Um, so I, first of all, Gretchen, welcome. And how are you doing right now? You might be on mute. Yeah, I'm right. Um, I'm doing okay. Keeping yeah. busy um, with with what we have going on um, with our retreat, but uh, you know, just feeling a, a, a lot of sadness with uh, with recent events. Watching some of the homecomings on the news is, um, you know, you think after eleven years it would be a little bit different. It's not. It's it's every bit as difficult to watch on TV today as it was, you know, in in the months and and year after our son was killed. It's 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 too difficult for me. I have to change the channel. I can't watch the the um, the the crowds of people on the sides of the road and the flags on the. I I can't watch that. It's it's too tough. So I'm thinking that the toughest part would be seeing, and I'm sorry, flag draped coffins coming mm -hmm. home. But but really, for a mom who lost a, a son, it's mm -hmm. it's seeing all these other family, you know, seeing the sort of joy of people finally coming home. Yeah, yeah. It's it that's that's the tough part. Um, there, there's no part of this that's easy, and there's no part of it that ever goes away. So for me, um, it's just profound sadness knowing that there are more families now that are going that are just beginning to go down this path, and they're just beginning this journey that is is the rest of their life. It will be for the very rest of their life, and it doesn't get easier, and it doesn't get better. Um, I feel for those people and I wish I had words to say to them, but truthfully, there are none. There are no words that I can offer them. Um, the, the, the person that said the best thing to me, most helpful thing to me, believe it or not, at my son's visitation, a fellow Gold Star mother um, said to me, this won't get any better. And you would think that would be <laughs> rather disheartening, but you know what? It was honesty. And, and she was really able to helped me manage my expectations. And so I didn't think in a week or a month or a year, I would wake up and it would be magically better. I, I knew that it wouldn't be, and it, and it helped me a lot. So um, yeah, watching the, watching, the, watching the casket being carried off the airplane is, is rough because they, su they supply a video of that. And every now and then, well, on the 14th, usually I, I try to watch it if I'm, in, in, I'm at my home, but it's, it's a tough one to watch. For sure. I, I know we talked before and, and you told me the story that um, when those Marines knocked on your door, uh, you didn't you didn't break down and cry. 
you, you had a very different reaction. You you um, took a swing at him. <laughs> well, I didn't literally take a swing at him. I threw a potted plant at him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, it was a big, heavy hanging basket, and I whipped it at our Keiko's head, and <laughs> I missed. I, you know, to my credit, I did miss. So, tried it, and it and it was. You know, it was something you 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 told Alec that that, that if if I see those Marines coming at that door, that's yeah, that's what I'm yeah. going to do. And you well, did you did what you said. Yeah. yeah, don't send them to my house because I won't let them in. Yeah. That's what I told them. So and so when, when they asked if they could come in, I said no, <laughs> you may not come in until my husband came home and he let him in, which really made me angry. So when uh, when does it sink in? When does it really sink in? Hmm. Weeks and months and years. I mean, it still hasn't. There are some days that it still hasn't that that I feel like that just days have gone by and he will you know it's interesting because his friends are 30 he's 19 he will always be 19 you know so for me it's interesting um to see some of his friends when they're buying homes and getting married and having babies and doing all these things that Alex should be doing and he's not um it's interesting because I kind of feel like he's still there and he's still coming home. So with the end of the war, I kind of feel like he should be coming home with, with the last of the Marines that were there. You know, so it's the, the human mind is just, <laughs> it's really kind of freaky. It, it, it plays tricks on me, you know, I think on all of us a lot. It, it, it allows us to believe things that aren't true and, and um, also makes us think things that are true aren't, you know. Yeah, real quickly. You decided to move from your home in, in northern Illinois. Mm -hmm. You and your husband went moved down to Tennessee uh, after this happened, and you decided to create this retreat um, for for combat veterans. Yes. Um, and, and you're still, I guess, in the process of finishing it up, but you're pretty far along the way. There's a lot of buildings are already up. Mm -hmm. What do you hope to do? We hope to bring combat veterans together um, and give them a place where they can just take a breath and, and communicate with other people who get it, who have been where they've been. Um, and truth be told, if we can honestly prevent one more veteran suicide, that would be the, the end goal. I mean, I would like to prevent every single su suicide, but, but I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that that wouldn't happen. But even if one, one person you know, can come to the lodge thinking, you know, things aren't going well. I, I could really just give it up, but I'm going to, I'm going to try this one thing. And they leave having changed their mind. That's not only one life, that's that person's family and that person's community and that person's employer. And that, I mean, it's a, it's a ripple effect and it, it involves so many people. Um, that would be, that would be the best thing that we could possibly hope for. And uh, you, you've been able to track, you keep track of the people in, in the unit and six members of Dark Horse have committed suicide that you were able to track. So, well, there's, yeah, there's more than that, but that we know of, you know, for sure, there's, there's too many. And Brown University tracks the cost of, of the war. And they said during that time, you, you, a couple thousand troops died, like your son, and then some 30,000 uh, committed suicide during the same the same time frame, you know, the 20 yes. year war. So clearly- Yes, our, our dining hall actually is named for um, a combat uh, veteran who came home and took his life on, two th in, on Thanksgiving day in 2005. So we have, um, we have dedicated the dining hall um, as Bowman Hall in his honor because he is the target audience for who we are trying to reach at Dark Horse Lodge. Um, and we'll have 25 bedrooms, each one named for one of those Marines that was killed in my son's unit. So um, we hope to be fully, uh, fully uh, engaged at all times with as many veterans as we possibly can throughout the year. And it's year round. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough assignment. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm going to move along. We're, we've been talking a little bit about uh, about suicide and Quill had mentioned the, the notion of, of moral injury. I've got a video here. I interviewed a doctor at the VA here in San Diego who, who deals with PTSD. Um, I know that the, the events of the last month have the real potential to, to bring up certain thoughts and feelings. And um, 
I just want to stress that the, the VA, the Department of Defense, and, and all sorts of veterans organizations have resources to help vets who are struggling. And I, you know, I just want to say that your feelings are valid and, and you know, get your, you know, take care of yourself out there. So if Claudine could uh, play the video. My name is Dr. Abigail Ankow. I'm a psychologist. I am the PTSD director at VA San Diego, and I'm also a consultant with the PTSD consultation program through the National Center for PTSD. When we think of moral injury, we have to take a few steps back and think of what's a more morally injurious event or what's a moral, an event that might lead to moral injury. And really it's any time a line has been crossed in terms of somebody's moral beliefs. And in the context of war in general, I think there are, moral injury has been most studied with military service members and in veterans because there are these instances where it's a very hierarchical structure and people may be faced with having to make orders or to do something which might hurt or kill somebody else, which might lead to a moral injury. What we're seeing a lot is frustration and sadness, helplessness, anger, people feeling betrayed. At the same time, you may not obviously be able to tell that somebody's upset. And so I think approaching people generally with how are you doing and seeing what they share. Um, a big recommendation that we're saying is not to shut people down when they do share. So if they say that I'm feeling upset, just watching for that part of ourselves that doesn't like people to feel upset that that wants to say it's okay it's okay or don't feel that way you know or it's been years like those are the sort of things not to say all right so i mean i think that that helps kind of encapsulate some of these ideas here and including the whole idea of um uh, including the whole idea that uh, don't shut people down just sort of be kind of neutral Now's not a really great time to talk politics. You know, we all have our different thoughts on, um, you know, the purpose behind the war and the like, but um, just let people talk and kind of share their experience. From what I'm told, people ask very infrequently. So I'm gonna bring in James Seddon. He's an author and Navy veteran. Uh, in 2009, he was a liaison officer in Afghanistan. He took uh, congressmen and other American officials around Afghanistan to show them reconstruction projects. Um, I want to get into like what kind of conversations you were able to have with uh, with American officials on the ground, what they were asking. But first, you know, I just James, we, describe what you've gone through as somebody who was there in 2009, and you know, what are the events of the last month? You know, what are your thoughts? What what are your feelings? Oh, it's it's been really tough, and you know, when uh, uh, on that Sunday when uh, uh, Kabul fell. Even though the events of the, the previous couple of weeks has sort of pointed in that direction as things were not going well across the country and the Afghan security forces were not doing well, it was sort of heading in that direction. Uh, and yet the, the event itself still managed to be shocking. And so when I woke up on that Sunday and read the news, it was just hitting me really hard. And another uh, uh, veteran that I uh, uh, am connected with on Facebook uh, I was feeling like lost. And he, he posted something and said, what you need to do is reach out to your buddies who were there. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I opened up a Facebook chat and I threw in uh, all my buddies who were there with me and uh, quickly discovered that it was hitting all of us hard, um, which was, well, I don't know why that was surprising to me, but, you know, um, Steve, you like to say, if you talk to one veteran, you've talked to one veteran, you know, our, our opinions are all over the map and, um, you know, but it, it seemed a common thread that whatever, anybody thought about um, the war at the time or in, in the, in the 10 years since we'd been there um, it didn't matter. It was hitting all of us hard, whether you, whether you thought this was inevitable or whether you thought this day would never come, it, it hit everybody hard. Um, so it's been, it's been really tough to try to figure it out. It's hard to watch the Taliban celebrate in the very places where you struggled to keep that from happening. Um, and uh, you know, it, it forces everybody to examine what it was all about, you know, it, you know, what, what, what did I achieve? Was it worth it? Um, were the, the sacrifices and the people that you knew who were killed or hurt, what does that all mean now? Does it change what it meant? Um, so I think, I think all of us who are there are, are, are forced to confront that. And, and I think it's hit all of us hard. And, and I think also that the, uh, as Quill was mentioning, the, uh, the Afghans that we knew who are still there, 
who have not gotten out, who have still not gotten out, really uh, eats at us. And we feel incredibly helpless. Um, you know, I feel incredibly helpless. I'm, I'm in contact with an Afghan and trying to give him best information that I can, which isn't much, and um, trying to connect him with groups that, that are trying to help. But it's not much. It's not enough. It's inadequate. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, that that compounds things, that that, that, that tragedy has, has also happened. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm terrified that America will move on, frankly. I'm, I'm afraid that America's attention span, now that all the Americans are, or nearly all Americans are out, um, then America will move on and it won't have this, the sense of urgency of getting our allies out that we had for a few weeks there. Uh, but we need to maintain that because most of them are still there. And, uh, you know, so that's something I'm really worried about is that America will lose interest and in, in our allies will, uh, will be slowly hunted down and murdered by the Taliban. I talked with Sean Van Diver, who's one of the uh, vets who kind of um, started reaching out and creating that sort of digital Dunkirk to try to get um, uh, uh, people who had worked with the Americans, uh, get them out of Afghanistan. And he said that it was um, like the most clear mission of the war in Afghanistan was the, the mission to save people who had worked alongside Americans. Um, I, is it, I mean, is this hitting people that uh, in, in all vet categories, frankly, not even just Afghan vets? Are you hearing from people from other conflicts? Because I've heard some of that from vets who aren't even veterans of the war in Afghanistan. That's a, that sense of betrayal. Uh, yes, I've heard that too. And I'm, you know, one of the veteran groups I've been in has veterans from all eras in it. Um, Vietnam veterans in particular are, are, are feeling things pretty strongly, uh, you know, based on, on the way that conflict ended. Um, but even, even folks that, uh, you know, served in the eighties or nineties are, are feeling it. You know, I think there is a, a strong veteran connection regardless of when you served or, or what you were ordered to do or where you went um, that, that it, what happens to us is kind of a shared experience. And I think that's, there's strength in that. And I think that that's, that's good. And that helps people like me uh, with that support network. Um, so, yeah, I think it is, I think it's hitting all of us. I, I wanted to ask about, so it was your job back in 2009 to take, uh, I think at least one congressman and other American <laughs> officials uh, around and show them uh, the progress that was being made. Uh, explain a little bit where, were you getting good questions from people? Were they, did they yeah. seem engaged? Did they understand what was going on? They, they did. I mean, the, uh, it was dozens and dozens of congressmen. I, I took probably about a third of the United States Congress into and around Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, you know, for context in 2009, 2010, um, General McChrystal took command after I'd only been there for a few months um, and had made his assessment that, uh, that things were not going well in Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was making a case for a shift in strategy and additional resources. Um, and that's, so that, you know, that's the context in which I was working uh, and in which Congress was, was visiting uh, the war. Uh, you know, it's, it hasn't been the same 20 year war. Uh, you know, it's been very different. And so what was happening in 09 and 010 was very different than what was happening in 03, 04, 05, and was different from what's happening in 17, 18, 19. Um, but while I was there, that was the context. And, um, you know, I, I walked away convinced that, that Congress really does a, a pretty good job of our system creates a Congress that represents the rest of us, which means there are people that are really smart and know exactly uh, what's going on and have done their homework. And then there's people that are not paying as much attention to Afghanistan, just like the rest of the country. Um, it, uh, you've got uh, folks there that are highly interested and folks are less interested. I mean, if you, if you, if you look around your friends, uh, it's kind of what Congress is like, you know, they're, they're they are, their system does a pretty good job of creating that representation, which is good and bad, you know, that, that, that comes with pluses and minuses. Uh, we were, you know, we would get good questions, you know, there, and the general questions were things like, you know, is victory achievable? And what does victory look like? Um, they would ask those questions, which are great questions to ask. Um, they, they were asking what resources or what problems can we help you solve that you're facing today? You know, they're more like fine tuned questions. Um, I remember a conversation with uh, one congressman and an army colonel uh, in a host province in Eastern Afghanistan. And uh, we had taken them to FOPS Lerno to talk to the, uh, the forces out there. And he 
he, uh, this congressman asked the, the colonel in charge of the area, he said, you know, uh, what does, what does victory look like to you? And the colonel said, it's a Afghanistan government um, and military and society that can hold off a, the Taliban insurgency without U.S. troops being in combat. Uh, and that was what that colonel's definition of victory was like. And the, uh, the congressman then said, uh, well, I represent 200,000 folks from Indiana who are wondering why we're spending money for schools in Afghanistan when they feel like their own schools are underfunded. And the colonel said, well, you know, remember why we're in Afghanistan and building schools in Afghanistan helps keep America safe because it, it helps keep the Taliban away. So that's why we're yeah. doing that. So, I mean, but and, obviously there was tremendous amount of, of waste there. If you look at the special sure. inspector, yes. inspector general's report on for Afghan yeah. reconstruction, the cigar reports, they, they talk about waste dating all the way back oh, yeah. to the early days. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, and, uh, military officials not being able to spend the money fast enough, couldn't find enough projects on the ground to spend money on in Afghanistan. And, you know, the, obviously the, the phantom troops, things like that. Yeah, there's plenty there was of never 300,000 like 300, Afghan troops. And I, I thought one of the more telling things was the congressman asked, how long are we going to be here? And, uh, you know, again, this is in 2009. And the colonel said, well, if by we, you mean people like me with uniforms and guns and patrolling host province on the ground, uh, I hope not more than a few years. And in fact, they quit doing that in 2019 or 2013 and turned that area of the country over to the Afghan army who, who maintained it all the way till the uh, told, you know, toward the end. Um, and the Colonel then also said, you know, but if, if by we, you mean Americans helping Afghans, then I hope we never leave because the last time we did that, uh, it didn't work out for, well for the Afghans or for us. And I thought that the Congressman's response to all this, and I, I bring this conversation up because it is very illustrative of the kinds of conversations that were had all the time. Right. The Congressman looked at the Colonel and said, you know, I support you. And I even believe you. It's just going to be a hard sell in that gymnasium back in Indiana. And, and so I, it was, uh, you know, so uh, do you feel that the, have your thoughts on the mission changed dramatically over the last month or so? Um, Can you explain the war? You know, it's my, I had in 30 my seconds explanation and processing of this is a work in progress. I yeah. think that, you know, I, I was somebody who, um, you know, there were, among veterans, there were people who really believed in the mission deeply and others who um, did not and, and were there for their buddies and because they were ordered to go and they yeah. were professional soldiers. Uh, and, you know, I, I was in the camp, though, that was more of, of a belief in the mission. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I believed that the national security threat to the U.S. was real if Afghanistan fell back into the control of the Taliban. I fear that still. I fear that they will that we've rewound to 1999 and 2000, yeah. um, and they're you know they'll host international terrorists who'll hit our homeland again. I worry about that. I hope I'm wrong. We're going to find out, I guess. Um, and I also I fell in love with the country. You know, the more Afghans I met, the more I saw of the country. I, I fell in love with Afghanistan. So on top of the selfish national security interest, I got a, a really strong sense of the Afghan people are worthy of and deserving of uh better than they got and it's right. a worthy noble mission for us to try to help them all right we're going to circle back at the end i'll give you a, a chance sure. to kind of go into this a little more but i want to move on to we've yep. got uh nick here when i started mapping out this panel i actually wanted to look back at all of the people from san diego county who were killed over the course of a 20-year war the news of the day made that a little difficult, but I did manage to look back at, at a helicopter crash that killed a San Diego soldier in 2006. Justin O'Donnell, who was a cavalry scout with the 10th Mountain Division, his platoon was on a mountain at night near the Pakistan border. Justin and nine other soldiers died when their helicopter, when the helicopter sent to rescue them, struck a tree. Nick Pelosi, uh, he was had been thrown from the copter on an early, uh, earlier attempt to land. I was able to track him down in upstate New York. Nick, welcome. Hi. Hey, so what's, tell me a little bit about what you've been thinking and, and what you've been going through over the last month or so as, as we've seen all the headlines. Um, it's been pretty tough uh, to watch what's going on over there. Um, <clears throat> having so many friends that died and you know, I was wounded and tons of friends were wounded. Um, you you kind of question what it was all about. 
<clears throat> and um, <clears throat> why there was no coherent um, pullout from the country and why it was done the way it was done. Can you describe what the war was all about? <clears throat> I can. I mean, I was there, honestly, for the guys to my left and my right. I mean, there was, there is no, you know, things you see in the movie, like, oh, God and country and all that. It's, it's not like that when you're fighting for your life out in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan in the mountains. You, you did get some injuries just be from be, just being thrown from the chopper. What's 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 life been like since uh, since you came home? Well, I was also I'm also a Purple Heart recipient. I was also wounded um, up by Camp Keating. We established Camp Keating. My unit was the ones that dig um, that started Camp Keating. And hmm. um, if you've ever read the book or watched the movie The Outpost. Right. Uh, that's that was our unit, the first unit that was there. Ben Keating was my executive officer. Uh, yeah, it's just been it's been rough watching all the stuff that was going on over there recently. You know, I just and I didn't really understand. Really, it didn't click with me until I started looking for you know back at some of these things that happened near the beginning of the war and it's like this this has been 15 years since this uh this crash happened um i mean that's the difference between the time frame of the end of world war ii and the korean war it's the time between vietnam and the first gulf war but yet it's all this you know, a single conflict um what's it like to be part of something that i mean you were injured in 2006 you lost your friends in 2006 but this war is only really came to a close last month. I mean, how does that, it just seems amazing that that would have lasted this long. It is. Um, but if you know anything about the Taliban, they're very, uh, uh, they're very patient with what they do. They, they kind of go at their own pace of things if they want to, hmm. you know, attack American forces really hard or coalition forces really hard, they'll do it. If they want to pull back and, and recruit mm -hmm. and go back to Pakistan and whatnot for uh, the winter and stuff, it's, it's all on their time. You know, they, the old saying uh, the Taliban would say was, you have the watches, but we have the time. They'll, they'll wait you out. They definitely will. Mm -hmm. But what's it like to, you were injured in a war, um, this was 15 years ago and this war was just ending. I mean, what's it like to be a part of a conflict that simply goes on for so long? Does that change um, the nature of it, of your experience? It, it does. I mean, it's weird. You can kind of see different like generations within this war, um, kind of the earlier stuff. And then around the time that I was there, and then uh, the troop surge and whatnot, and then the drawdown. Um, it's just, I think we were there for much too long. That's just my opinion. Um, I think if, the, if our government would have let us, you know, take the gloves off and do what we do. I mean, I'm a cavalry scout. We don't rebuild nations. We don't do that. We close with and destroy the enemy. And that's what we're we're in the military to do it's you know kind of sounds brutal but that's what we're there to do that's what we're trained for we're not trained to rebuild nations and you know schools and, and whatnot i mean yeah that stuff's great but that's not a combat veteran's job <clears throat> military was kind of out of its skill set at times absolutely i mean we were being tasked out to do things that we just weren't trained to do. Um, there was no coherent uh, plan to anything that was going on at the time, at least. I don't know if it changed after. It doesn't hmm. really appear to be the case. When you talk about the cost of war, I, I think the estimates are we spent about a trillion dollars. And if you count all of the, the cost, including taking care of veterans, you know, 
for the next 20 years, it's, it's, it, that, that cost can double. Um, yeah. What do you think the next 20 years are going to be like for you and, and others like you who served? Um, hopefully it'll be a lot of healing for a lot of us. Um, that's, that's really what we need. Um, you know, we were asked, uh, some, some people were asked to go back so many times and into this extremely heavy combat. Um, it's, we need some time to heal from this stuff physically and mentally. Does ending the war, does that start the healing process? Does in some ways the clock starts now? <laughs> Honestly, I feel like we're the way we pulled out. I feel like it opened up new wounds. It's, it's horrible. The, the way we did this is, was not the way that it was supposed to be done. It's incompetence. All right. So I, I want to move on and we'll have a chance to talk a little more at the end here, but, uh, uh, Farhad uh, Popel, who she is the immigrant affairs manager for the city of San Diego. Before that, she worked with the State Department. She helped prepare the congressional reports on Afghanistan that we talked about uh, when she worked for the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction or Cigar. She's also she was born in uh, Afghanistan. She, her family came to the U.S. when she was only three weeks old. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask first off: Are, are you able to to stay in touch with uh, with family in Afghanistan? Are you hearing anything at this point? Thanks, Steve. Um, I think, like so many other Afghan Americans, we all have extended family um, of some form still there, and we do keep in touch. In addition to that. There are so many Afghan women, activists, journalists, others who weren't able to leave um, over the course of the last few weeks, and they are still there fighting for their rights in, in every way that they can um, while trying to stay safe, while trying to show the world that they shouldn't be forgotten, and, and really showing us what kind of Afghanistan they want to live in. Um, that's not the Afghanistan that, that the Taliban are, are offering them. So we are able to, to keep in touch with, with various groups. And, you know, it, it's, it's been really hard because as I'm sure a lot of the folks on this call as well um, have experienced, there's, there's a feeling of helplessness when you get messages uh, from people that you know or even don't know saying, my life is in danger because I worked with the US government or the international community or because I'm an artist and the, the Taliban don't, don't condone that. Or I you know, am an entrepreneur or I'm a female broadcaster or, or any, any number of people in society who are now at risk because who they are, what they represent, their, their ethnic group, their uh, religion, their um, political ideology doesn't, doesn't align with, with the current terrorist regime. Um, so people on the ground in, in Afghanistan are, are, scared, but they're also incredibly brave and courageous and resilient because they've had to be. And if, if you've seen on, on the news or on Twitter uh, in, in recent days, you know, there, there are Afghan women who are looking Taliban members in the face with a gun pointed at them and demanding their rights. Um, so when, when we ask about the, the, the last 20 years, I think that's a really important part of the story as well. Um, Afghans have been fighting for, for their rights um, side by side with American support. And now that that American support isn't there in the same way, they, they continue to stand and they continue to fight because that's what they've always done. They did it before the, the last 20 years. They've been doing it for the last 40 and even longer. Do you think we should have stayed? Um, personally, do you think America should have stayed in Afghanistan? I think the question is less about whether troops should have been on the ground and more what does 
a genuine peace process look like? What does creating a foundation for peace look like? Um, how can we ensure meaningful inclusion of Afghan women in, in, that, in that peace building process? I think that the events of the last year and a half, starting with the signing of the U.S. Taliban agreement, that was essentially a, it, it was a withdrawal agreement. It, it was not a peace agreement. Um, starting with that and continuing to the, the sort of impatience with, with the peace process in Doha um, and with, with events since then, I think all of that contributed to a situation where even if there, there were no troops on the ground, there was a way to have, have that conversation, have that very intentional way of, of withdrawing that wouldn't have resulted in the situation that we see on the ground today. I don't think anybody was in favor of US troops or, or, or NATO troops on the ground forever in, in Afghanistan, neither Afghans nor Americans, not, not anyone. But, but the question was, how do you how do you responsibly withdraw and create an environment that allows for peace and allows for stability and the type of Afghanistan that Afghans actually want to live in, not the prison that they have now been subjected to? This is very personal for you. Yes. Yes, it is. We're starting to see some some Afghans coming into San Diego. What are you able to do for them? Yes. We are. So San Diego has actually been resettling Afghan refugees for, for quite a while now, uh, both primary refugees and special immigrant visa holders. And we are a welcoming city here in San Diego. We're a welcoming region. Um, we believe that everyone has dignity and, and respect and inherent value. And I think that that welcoming message is, is so important for this population who has experienced trauma on their journey to, to get here. Um, and being able to support them through our fantastic local refugee resettlement agencies, through other community-based organizations that, that are providing support, that experience is going to be so valuable for, for these Afghans. And I think you know, San Diego is is a city that uh, has twenty five of our population is 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 foreign born, and mm -hmm. and so having an environment where where people feel people feel like they are welcome and we're inclusive, not only right. in our words but but in our actions, is is so important. It just uh, real briefly, are you seeing a lot of people coming in so far, or they're still somewhere in the process? The, the process is, is a bit of a long one. So we have evacuees who were taken to a, a base in Qatar. From there, they may be processed at other, uh, at, at other bases before coming to the United States. And, and then we've got about they, four or five different bases now right. that are here in the U.S. And yes. I just wondered if, if people were processing out. I'd heard secondhand that some people are starting to move through rather quickly, even though there had been a lot of delays in the SIV program, that uh, uh, once you know, some of the paperwork and red tape had been cleared away, some of these folks are moving pretty quickly at this point. I think in, in San Diego, what we, we should definitely expect to, to, see, to see some Afghan refugees arriving in, in the next couple of weeks. There you go. So I, I want to move on to make sure we get uh, Kendra Garza in here. She's, uh, she was a sergeant in the Army growing up in Georgia. She wanted to join the military after September 11, 2001. She was a combat MP in the, with the 173rd Airborne and deployed to Afghanistan in 2009-2010 where she lost her leg in an IED, flat, IED blast. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the role of women in combat and how that expanded during the time frame of the war in Afghanistan. But first, um, tell me about that day, uh, that day when you lost your leg. So that day, I was actually attached to 191 Cav, and we were going out there. We had got intel that there was being an IED in place, so our mission was to go out there. Um, it was a dismounted mission. So we was on foot. We wasn't in a vehicle. 
and we were to go out there, secure the location as we escorted engineers and EOD to disarm the IED. Well, on our way out there, we took, um, you know, we took a route that we never used because we didn't want to play into the enemy's, you know, hands. So we took this crazy route, came out into a bazaar where normally it's real busy. That's where they sell their goods and their meats and their breads. And there wasn't a soul in sight. So we all knew something was about to happen. All the signs was there. But we continued to push forward anyway. I remember I was the third man. We was in a diagonal formation. And we were kind of walking through the center of the bazaar. And we were clearing to the left and right as we pushed forward. So I had an alleyway coming up on my left. So there was buildings um, to my left. So I decided, you know, well, the proper way to clear left is you hug that outer wall of the building. So the building protects you in case there's any, you know, uh, enemy or you're going to take rounds when you clear that corner. So that's what I did. Right before I got to the corner, I went to step forward with my right leg and they were watching us. They remote detonated an ID that had been in place in the outer wall of this building. So it was initially in place to hit a soldier in the rib. But because I hugged the I you know hugged this building, it instantly took my left leg off. Um, I remember whenever I got hit, everything slowed down. Everything stood still. It felt like the longest five seconds because you automatically take a war pause, a five second pause to see if there's enemy fire coming from a, you know, a certain location or if there's another ID. And in those five seconds, as I fell to the ground, I remember when I hit the ground, I've never felt more helpless and scared um, I was now laying in the middle of Afghanistan. I couldn't run. I had no idea where my weapon was. And so I had to completely rely on my battle buddies to my left and right. So when I hear these other people say, you know, that soldiers are there for their battle buddy on their left and right, this is a prime example of why. Because we rely solely on them to keep us alive and bring us home. As that's why I'm here today. So what's it been like over the last several weeks as you've been watching, you know, the war come to its end? It's been disgusting. Um, whenever I first heard about it or started seeing it, I was in shock, disbelief. Um, I had to double check and make sure that the information I was getting was correct. Um, I can't, I really cannot comprehend how our government allowed this to take place. There have been many lives lost. There have been many soldiers, you know, who have sacrificed part of them, you know, to, to complete this mission in Afghanistan and to stabilize that country. And just like that, all of the progress we had made is completely gone. We're right back to square one. Yeah. So, um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is talk about how the role of women expanded in combat. Um, if you look at the history of the war in Afghanistan, among the first um, uh, U.S. troops to die was uh, Jeanette Winters. Uh, um, right at the beginning of the war um, in 2002, and then two of the women uh, who who died. Uh, in the bombing uh, in Afghan in, in, at the Kabul airport, both of them were women, and I think we're also going to find out that some of the some of the injured Marines that are at Walter Reed right now, uh, who survived, uh, also women. Do you feel like you're, you're part of that fraternity? Do you feel like you got a lot of support when you came home? Uh, when when you're in in the streets uh, in Georgia, do do people assume you're a combat veteran when they see you with with a single limb? Uh, no, never. <laughs> no, never. They never assume I'm a combat veteran. I always get the response that, you know, I didn't know females were in the line of duty. 
um, fighting right beside our men. And a uh, back story, whenever I got blown up in 2010, I was laying in Walter Reed, you know, just had been injured whenever our media outlet comes across the TV and announces that females are going to finally be able to fight on the front lines with our men. And so that's the example there of how females had not been recognized prior to them announcing them, although we were already fighting with our men. Well, how, well, how did that make you feel? You're, you're in Walter Reed, you've already lost a limb, you're going through surgery after surgery, and you're being told, oh, finally, they're going to allow women into combat. It's just... It, you know, my dad was with me, and me and my dad just kind of looked at each other with disbelief, like, well, what was I doing? You know, you kind of feel overlooked. Um, but in that same aspect, once uh, people heard that a female had been severely injured. You know, they they all want to hear your story because it's unique. Does it change your experience now as a veteran? Do you feel fully embraced um, considering what you sacrificed by the rest of the veteran, um, the larger veteran community? Sometimes, yeah. Uh, most of the time, more, more times than not. Um, I remember I got transferred to uh, San Antonio, Bamsey, and I was there about a week or two before anyone came up and talked to me. I was still in a wheelchair, and I started making friends, and um, some of the battle buddies that was there, they actually told me that whenever they first seen me, they didn't believe I was a real combat wounded veteran, you know, they thought that I had been injured in a train accident or a bike, you know, accident. So once, once we make it over that hump, I mean, we're like, you know, brother and sister. I think it's a bond that you instantly have with other veterans. Kate, how do you explain um, your service in Afghanistan? How do you explain the war to somebody who hasn't experienced what you've experienced? I, okay, so my mission, um, I'm a mili I was a military trooper. Um, half of our platoon got attached to one on one calf. And so we had two missions. One of mine was to search women and children. But whenever I wasn't out on mission with Cav Scouts, uh, we were training. Our job was to train the local army and Afghan police how to properly conduct their jobs. How, how to lead an army, how to uh, be a respectful police officer. And so that was our biggest mission. Um, and, you know, at first, when we first worked with them, they were like kind of working with kids, you know, because the language barrier and uh, we had interpreters. But uh, we eventually started making progress. Okay. And so you kind of just explain explain your service to people. Do you do you like it when people ask you about your service? Do you uh, want honestly, to talk? Honestly, I, I, that's how I healed in the very beginning. Um, I was with nothing but males. And to male, I felt like, you know, they thought like, this is cool, you know, got some battle wounds. But as a woman, I felt as if I was supposed to be soft and beautiful and wear high heel shoes. And um, so, yeah, in the very beginning, I, I struggled big time with self-confidence and I found my way of healing was talking about it. So it is an opportunity. Do you like dumb mm -hmm. questions? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me one. Um, one of the questions. Sure. Um, you know, some of the, I always have little kids run up, like whenever I wouldn't wear my prosthetic, I'd have little kids run up and like look for my leg, like physically get down on all fours, ask me where my leg was. <laughs> so I get a lot of interest from kids. <laughs> so sometimes it's, it's, it's well-meaning or. 
curiosity mm -hmm. from small kids. Well, I, I want to yeah. kind of open it up to some questions here. I, I noticed we've got several in the chat. I know also I've noticed the chat has become kind of a memorial. A lot of people are mentioning uh, people that they have lost. And so I would I would ask everyone to refer to that and take a look at some of the people who are, are kind of checking in with some of the people that they lost over the last 20 years. But we've got uh, Jeremy Joseph, um, who's asked, uh, how, how do the military members on the panel view how uh, the blowback from American foreign policy may result in more frequent use of the military in wars? Uh, blowback typically refers to the unintended consequences and unwanted side effects of an operation or action. So I guess I could ask folks in the panel, do they think um, I, you know, after Vietnam, there was a 15 year period where we really didn't do things, uh, major interventions until uh, the Gulf War. It, do you think there will be some uh, a peace dividend in that sense? Or do you think uh, we're going to have much shorter memories now? I'll open that up. Uh, so speaking, like I remember um, when uh, things were, were heating up with Syria, uh, and, you know, their chemical weapons, uh, you started to hear in a lot of corners, uh, war drums beating pretty loudly. And so I, I don't have a lot of faith that America is going to, um, I guess, hesitate or think as much about it as they, as they should. I think, you know, you covered and Quill covered at the beginning, how, what a tiny percentage of our population actually serves in the military and has a connection to someone who has. And so I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, the messiness and complexities that Iraq and Afghanistan have revealed about foreign military interventions, I'm not sure that will create hesitation in the future, unfortunately. It should. Everybody should think twice, 10 times, 100 times before doing that. Uh, but I'm not sure that, that America is going to. That's just my opinion. Nick, what do you think? Nick Pelosi, what do you think? Do you think we're going to be more or less likely in the future to engage in something like like Afghanistan? Um, <laughs> I hope we're, it's unlikely that we will, but I, I don't have any confidence in, in our government very much anymore. Um, like you said, there's so few people that serve, you know, these, these politicians and stuff are not connected to this in any way, shape or form. Their kids aren't over there you know, losing their legs and whatnot. So they could probably care less. That's what it seems like. Hmm. Do you, oh, from some of the coverage and just talking to people over the last month, did you get a sense that people really do understand what the war in Afghanistan was about, that they were focused in on it? Really? Military mm -hmm. vets or yeah, civilians? Be it vets or, or especially civilians. Um. I don't think the civilians understand what we were going through over there. It wasn't really covered, at least when I was there, it wasn't really covered in the media that much. Everybody was focused on Iraq, um, you know, to the point that they, we didn't have many aviation assets in Afghanistan at that time, which cost people their lives. They, you know, the politicians can say that it didn't. It did. It absolutely did. And, um, you know, hopefully we learn from this. I, mm. I really hope so. So, you know, the next generation doesn't have to go through what we went through with this. Um, Quill, are you around? Yeah. How, hey. Yeah. So how hard is it? Was it hard to get stories on the air about the war in Afghanistan? Did did, was there a lot of curiosity among editors? Is this a failure on us, our part, in the media? We just simply weren't out there telling the stories that needed to be told. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, I, you know, NPR and others invested in having a bureau, uh, someone living in Kabul all that time. We covered Iraq as long as there were a lot of American troops there. There were definitely, uh, there was definitely space to get stories on the air. But it, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, a, a, a special forces general I was interviewing for that home front series uh, said it this way to me. He said, you know, uh, American people, civilians, they did everything that was asked of them in these wars. 
they just weren't asked to do much. And I, I think that, that the fact that they weren't asked to participate and weren't asked to help. And you know, very early on, there was the idea that, well, if we if we can run this war without causing pain to civilians, then we'll be able to uh, sort of perceive pursue our aims unhindered the way we were during Vietnam, something like that. And and what it actually just turned out was is that 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 means that the um, our government kind of loses interest. Uh, you know, the, our elected government, it's not a huge issue for them, and there's less oversight and. It, you know, people have that sort of, you know, for so many years, you get that sort of look like, oh, is that still going on over there? And, you know, the, the, um, the dramatic end to the Afghan war is really just, you know, one in a series of, and there's, there's so much blame to go around for, for how that was handled and how uh, a mission kept going that uh, it was sort of on autopilot. No, nobody wanted to be the one to end it. Nobody wanted to be the general who had it. And, and on their watch, you know, troops plussed up, troops, troops shrunk, shrunk down. It was, um, it, it's part of that disengagement of, of the populace. If there was a clear mandate from the American people, we want you to stay for this reason, or we want you to come home. But the way they, the, it was set up sort of to insulate people from any pain, uh, it, it, it came back to haunt the military for sure. I don't know, is, is and I don't mean to sort of, put a happy face on anything, but uh, is there something to be said though that there is a definite end to the war that people acknowledge? Uh, unlike, I can't, I'm trying to think how the war in Iraq really ended other than US forces kind of like drove down to Kuwait and set up shop at Ali Asaline. Um, well, you know, it, it was, there was a double pump there too, you know, it, it, because of course, ISIS came back in very quickly, took Mosul in a very similar way to how the Taliban uh, managed to take all of Afghanistan without that many troops, without that much opposition, with a you know a, an Iraqi army that that fled maybe too quickly, and and then the U.S. intervened again. Now it seems less likely that that'll happen in Afghanistan because we pulled up all of this infrastructure and the the over the horizon capability we've got to um, to use drones and other other uh, sort of you know far away measures is really complicated because we've had such trouble with civilian casualties even when we had spotters on the ground it's going to be much more problematic now as we've already seen i mean with it seems like 50 percent of the announced strikes we've made from those oversight over the horizon capabilities have possibly hit a lot of civilians so um it's hard to see uh, sort of returning to Afghanistan very quickly. But I know there are people who think that we'll be back there for counterterrorism reasons. I think, Kendra, I'm going to try to give you the last word here. Is there something to be said for the it's over? And now that it's over, what, um, aside from how things resolved at the end, is there an overall feeling? Is there any relief at all? Does this does, does this bring any comfort to people who fought all of those years that, it, if nothing else, the war is finally over? You know, if we was to, if we was to set aside how we pulled out of there, there, it would have brought great peace knowing that, you know, we had came out of there, we had stabilized that country, we had helped many civilians, you know, and it would have brought peace knowing our battle buddies are no longer over there fighting, you know, while we're sleeping safe here at night. It definitely would have brought peace. And it does. It does bring some peace, but I think it's too fresh right now for any combat veteran to feel at peace. Can I offer a final thought, Steve? Do it. I really, um, I, I understand theoretically as much as a civilian can um, that combat veterans are primarily there for their buddy to the right and their buddy to the left. And I understand that. And I understand that you rely on them to get you home. But I implore all of you who came home not to feel responsibility for those that you weren't able to bring home because it's not always possible. And there isn't a gold star family that I know who blames the friends of their son or daughter for not bringing them home. I know we personally, no way do we blame any of Alex's friends 
for not bringing them home. So him home. So I really, really beg of you not to feel responsible for not bringing them home because it just isn't possible. So, uh, you know, that's just a final thought. I, I, there's so many um, horrible feelings that are happening since, you know, a few weeks ago, and I'm afraid it's going to be worse for a lot of veterans. Um, and I, and I hate to see that. So I just ask you, please not to feel responsible for not bringing them home. The ones who couldn't come home. Uh, Gretchen Catherwood, a gold star mom. Yeah, I think that's a, those are good final thoughts. I also am noticing the chat. Um, um, Farhat and is saying that, um, um, you know, it's, it's not over for the people in Afghanistan. So, you know, I, I guess we need to clarify that this is the end of America's involvement in, uh, at least in combat in Afghanistan. All right, I think we're gonna end it right there. Um, I wanna thank all of my guests here, uh, along with the uh, uh, American Homefront Project and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, as well as my own station, KPBS. This event uh, will live on at the KPBS YouTube channel. Um, the podcast, Rough Translation, and the series Homefront. Uh, go ahead and check that out. And also check out all sorts of news in mil on military and veterans at kpbs.org. There are a couple of specials coming up uh, on KPBS TV. Uh, Frontlines has its special America after 9-11. It's available for streaming and, and uh, at uh, kpbs.org. And there's a series coming up on PBS American Veteran, which uh, debuts October 26. I'm your host, Steve Walsh. Thank you so much for listening.